Hello and welcome everybody to the second talk in our Planted Unplug series in association with Biotecture. Carbon capture, investigating the role that design has to rid ourselves of our carbon addiction. My name's Oliver Heath and I'm the Biophilic Design Advisor for Planted, the first contemporary design show aimed at reconnecting our cities with nature. Today, as we explore how design, sustainability and architecture and nature can combine to create cleaner, greener, healthier and happier cities, I'm delighted to welcome three of the UK's leading experts when it comes to understanding the role that the design industry has in mitigating our use of carbon and emissions and embodied carbon. We all know the problems associated with industrialised carbon consumption, but how do we fix these through the medium of design? Burning and consuming carbon on an unprecedented scale in recent centuries has seen the Earth's temperature rise to a point we're now seeing noticeable and destructive changes to our climate patterns. In recent times, however, there has been a growth in agricultural land management and building design methods, including rewilding projects, which have given us given rise new hope to the sense that it may be possible to turn the tide on carbon consumption. But how can the design industry take a more creative approach to the mitigation of carbon? Well, today I'm joined by Seb Cox, uh, Oksana Bondar and Andrew War, and we're going to be discussing that subject. So initially, I just want to kind of like introduce them all briefly, and then I'm going to give them a chance to talk. So on the end here, we have Andrew War from War Thistleton Architects. So Andrew is a founder of War Thistleton Architects, is passionate advocate of low carbon design and construction, encouraging clients to look at the beauty and benefits of innovation. He's led the practice on a number of design uh, award-winning schemes, which are responsible for the delivery of projects such as Murray Grove, the building which spearheaded the international movement of tall timber construction. He teaches and lectures frequency, frequently and is a member of the steering committee for the Architects for Care in the UK. Next, we have Oksana Bonda from Biome, who are sustainable material innovators. Oksana is a regenerative designer and innovator with almost a decade of experience in entrepreneurship, design and circular economics. She's passionate about circular design and her extensive theoretical and practical knowledge of the concept can be seen throughout her work. Oksana leads Biome's design functions and business innovation which are aligned with biomimicry and cradle-to-cradle methodologies. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. And we have Sebastian Cox from Sebastian Cox Furniture. Um, his training was in design, making and sustainability. He grew up in the Kent countryside, where I think we spent hours playing in the woods, developing a deep respect for them as a resource and a near sacred space. And that's something that you've brought into your work. So particular interest in land management, uh, carbon consumption of the materials you're using, plus the quality of the pieces that you're creating. And is deeply involved in this idea of land management and materials. So. What I'd now like to ask each of you to do is to just talk a little bit about your background, your experience in carbon conscious design. So Seb, can I ask you to kick the conversation off please? Sure. So um, yes, yeah, so we run a business in uh, South East London, designing and making things from British wood. And um, we work with in interior designers, architects, um, <clears throat> private clients, brands, etc. And um, our sort of goal is to, well, we have many goals, but some of them are to uh, use, soak up 100 tonnes of carbon dioxide every year in the products that we, that we make and sell. Um, and we do that by principally working with wood. Um, and uh, a sort of an interesting t statistic which caught my attention when I was studying was that uh, in the UK, we import something like 90% of our wood. And we are, um, in terms of our imports, the only country in the world that imports more wood than us is China by volume, which is an absolutely enormous reliance uh, on imported uh, materials when we have uh, vast amounts of uh, unmanaged woodland here in the UK. So I, want, I set my business up originally looking at coppicing and tackled kind of a number of issues, big issues uh, with the business um, as best I could. Uh, the two main ones are carbon capture and sequestration and biodiversity decline and how those two things can maybe come together um, to kind of uh, 
to, to, to change the way that we think about resources, to change the way that we use, manage woodlands and, and, and create resources. Um, I think uh, something that certainly Andrew and I share uh, very closely is this idea that wood is solid CO2. So um, when we are making things uh, and not burning wood, uh, we're, take, we're extracting from habitats in a positive way that boosts biodiversity if it's done right. We're then storing that carbon in people's homes, either in the fabric of the building or the pr products and objects in their home. And then at the same time, the woodlands are replenishing themselves and soaking up more carbon. It's very rare to find an intervention that humans can make which actually really positively benefits the planet and the habitats and ecosystems uh, from which you're extracting a resource. And so for that reason, I think wood is hands down the single best material uh, on the planet. And I think if we were to sit down and try and design a material uh, for this century, we'd probably end up with something that looked a lot like wood. You know, we'd sort of be thinking strong light, readily available, warm to the touch, different every time you looked at it, um, good for us in our homes. Uh, and if we were being really audacious, we'd say, well, let's have it produce the oxygen that we breathe and soak up the carbon dioxide that we're emitting everywhere else. And so we'd end up with wood. So a passionate, passionate advocate for the use of timber, <laughs> Very I, much so. I would say. So yeah, yeah. Um, Oksana. Yeah, more about your experiences and, and beliefs around this, this area of carbon capture. Sure, um, just to kind of introduce it to Biome and who we are and what we do. So Biome is a research and development led company that truly allows you know, uh, nature to lead innovation um, to revolutionize construction and the way we create the built environment. And I guess maybe before I jump into how we deal with carbon, how we capture it, I thought maybe I'll take you all back to school just for a very brief lesson um, on chemistry and biology. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. So let's, let's have a look and maybe demystify carbon a little bit. So carbon is actually the fourth most abundant element in the universe by mass. It's, um, it's actually the second most abundant element in our bodies, right? Uh, in combination with oxygen, it forms the carbon dioxide gas which actually naturally occurs in the atmosphere as a trace gas. It participates in energy metabolism of all plants, um, animals and microorganisms. It can be found in our groundwaters, in seawater, rivers, lakes, as well as it forms our soils, deposits of fossil fuels and limestone. So, you know, carbon is actually a vital part of this natural cycle. And um, the reason it, it has become a problem when we are talking about it today is because our industrial activities, like you said, Oliver, um, have disturbed the equilibrium within the ecosystems and we're now facing a climate crisis. crisis. But our biome, we believe that there is a solution and it's biomimetics. And um, for those of the audience that don't know what biomimetics is, it's design um, inspired by Sorry. It's, it's basically mimicking the way uh, challenges and problems have been solved in biology and applying that knowledge um, into functional design solutions. So biomimetics is really at the core of everything we do and we have a few methods of how to apply biomimetics. One of them is uh, a good example of a collection of our bio-based materials. So in nature, as, you know, as we can notice, the, the concept of waste is non-existent. So that principle we apply in our materials, we use waste um, of the agricultural food as well as some of the synthetic waste streams and create materials. One of them, for instance, is all or organic refused by a compound. So for all, we take food and agricultural waste, combine it with our unique organic binder and then uh, form it into either sheets or any other 3D forms and objects. Um, so all um, it's called compostable and all can be put back into our manufacturing processes which makes a circular and regenerative, regenerative material which again locks that carbon in, in the cycle of our materials and, and, and in kind of design as well as products. Um, the other material is mycelium which is the vegetable structure of mushrooms. So we really harness, actually directly collaborate with nature here with mycelium, you know, it harnesses power to form complex binding networks as it grows through synthetic um, or organic substrates which again in our case we use waste um, waste streams um, and log that carbon contain containing waste streams in the material 
um, when it grows. So we use mycelium to produce insulation panels, um, as well as other products too. Yeah. Apart from materials, uh, we apply biomimetic principles and mimicking is really the, the, the way nature does things um, with our production facility, which is um, being established in collaboration with the social enterprise, the Onion Collective. And within that facility, we put an emphasis on symbiosis and cooperation because the facility is designed to be community-led. So we actually involve all the other stakeholders to participate in the industry and how we do things, how we produce things. Um, and also, it's actually designed to be completely closed loop. So any CO2 produced in the facility by mycelium as it grows, which is a natural process, is uh, going to be fed through the greenhouse turned into oxygen and then fed back into the incubation spaces. And I guess another good example of us mimicking nature in the way that it circulates carbon and makes it a natural vital part of, of, of the cycle and the process is um, a construction system, Trigony. So Trigony is, um, is a directly inspired by nature, by the way it's designed, it's actually sections are based one of the strongest shapes found in nature, hexagon, um, and beehives, and coincidentally here carbon molecules, are hexagon in shape and proved to be extremely structurally integral. Great. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you for the lesson. <laughs> thank you. I think it's good for us to kind of outline the issue around mm. carbon. Yes, that it's kind of naturally occurring, it's everywhere, mm. but that it's the man-made activities that's bringing it out and it's, Andrew, tell us more about your work. Oh, okay. So I'm so fascinated by what you've just been talking about. I'm like, wow, that's so exciting. <laughs> um, so um, it's a little kind of prosaic in, in, in comparison, but we are um, an architect's practice, water distance and architects, and we're based in uh, Shoreditch in East London. And we design and draw and research and build in timber. <clears throat> And that's really all sorts of buildings, um, large office buildings, large apartment buildings, uh, small buildings, <laughs> whatever, really, whatever we can get. So uh, we've been doing that for the last, uh, we did our first CLT building, our first cross laminated timber. So we use, primarily we use engineered timbers, which are where you get, where you use planks of timber and you glue them together in straight lines or, or you cross laminate them to make them stronger fabricate those into big panels or beams and they become really industrial components for the, to, to make the structural systems of large buildings and we built our first building like that the first one in the UK about um, 18 years ago and um, have built I don't know 25 ish of those since then um, and have projects in the UK and, and further afield now in, in, throughout Europe and so um, really have established ourselves and established a kind of sort of I guess a kind of an ethos or a kind of a practice purpose which is about really exploring what the opportunities of this kind of material can be both you know how big how large what but what kind of architecture is produced when you start to use a new material so in 2008 ish we built um, a building called Murray Grove which you referred to earlier which is a nine-story apartment building and really that was kind of I think quite a shift in the perception of how kind of low carbon buildings might evolve because I think that for a long time I mean architects architecture the construction industry have been interested or understanding the impacts of construction but the solutions to those seem to have been kind of always quite peripheral you know, so like bird watching centers in Norfolk or something. It always kind of like, and it hasn't really, it hasn't really managed to establish any kind of real sort of mainstream kind of value. It hasn't been considered seriously as a kind of, as an opportunity to really change the way that we build our cities. So our purpose, our kind of, our mission is really being to think about how we can decarbonize the, you know, the construction industry so yeah, it's a bit ambitious, but um, you know, construction and, uh, and management, refurbishment of buildings, about 40% of the UK's carbon footprint and about half its landfill. 
So this is really something that the architecture profession, that the construction industry really needs to get behind. And currently, the way in which we calculate the carbon footprint of the building and that we look to reduce the carbon footprint of the building is all about the operations of that building. It's all about the heating, and the lighting, and the cooling of that building. But actually, the upfront carbon, the carbon that is used to process, uh, to manufacture the materials for the construction process on site, actually that isn't accounted for anywhere in UK law, anywhere in planning guidance. Because that was sort of the embodied carbon. The embodied carbon, yeah, yeah which sort of um, using the phrase upfront carbon as a kind of like trying to unwrap some of that kind of, you know, some of that sort of moist esoteric language so that people understand that, you know, when you start a building, you start with a massive carbon footprint. I mean, just the production of, of concrete and steel produces about five times more carbon than airline travel. So it means an incredible amount of pollution is caused by, by those industries. And so we need to find a viable alternative to concrete and steel. And we believe um, that we can do that through the use of engineered teams. And so that's what we've been doing for 20 years. <laughs> so building big timber buildings is what we do. So we have a really strong belief in the value of this cross-laminated approach yeah. and its ability to reduce the embodied carbon in the building. So, so you mentioned quite a number of statistics about the impact of the building industry in the UK or globally. Yeah. Um, what about furniture? I mean, how bad is the furniture industry in general? I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to say I'm so delighted to be part planted because at last we're getting a chance to talk about good design and embodied carbon, about the reuse of materials, you know, the things that I've seen design shows across the years just completely sidelined as a bit of a niche or hey, it's the, it's the eco bit. Now, now we're putting it front and center, you know, this is the future of design. But I still like, I just can't get over, you know, how many design shows there are. It's like, look, we've got another plastic chair. How bad is it? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think, um, I think there is a, there's a sort of a dangerous thing that's ha been happening over the last like, five years with furniture, uh, which is that it's sort of trying to get into the cycles that fashion has in terms of like autumn, winter, spring, mm -hmm. summer like you have furniture on those short-term trends and, and there are a lot of kind of magazines and things that kind of support that. Um, and, you know, we know that we live in a world with too much stuff, don't we? You know, it's just all objects uh, are draining resources and, and filling up landfill sites. So, um, it, but in terms of um, carbon, um, what we have tried to do is to actually measure the carbon in the objects that we're buying. We're, we're trying to sort of, I suppose, kind of, set precedent for that um, I believe that that should happen across all things that we consume it's, it's relatively easy to measure um, uh, and actually it's quite easy to understand because you can just have a tokenizer for your year and I, I actually a student built um, a, a, an Excel spreadsheet which calculated my my 10 ton year and I tried to keep it below that and and um, and I, I just think that should be just a part of common parlance whereas at the moment it, everything's ambiguous um, you're not really sure what you're buying. I think most people would be really surprised at quite how much um, MDF there is out there. Uh, all right, MDF still stores carbon, but it's quite an energy intensive process. And um, you know, it's interesting. We've learned that we are incredibly niche because we only work in, in solid wood um, in, in the furniture industry. And um, so there, there's lots of opportunities for change. I, it's not nearly as bad as 40% of the emissions uh, of, of a country. Um, but I think that there is a real inherent value in challenging um, the things that we surround ourselves with on our day-to-day -day lives. You know, um, I think that the objects uh, that occupy our living spaces uh, matter and, um, and impact. Um, so as a business, as a company, we're, we're trying to sort of challenge some of those norms and. Um, trying to improve things. Yeah, I mean, I guess along with the democratization of design that certain retailers have promoted over the years, comes a sense of, you know, sell it cheap, I'm going out, it's only going to yeah. last a couple of years, don't expect too much of it, and when it's when it's gone, it's gone, you can't fix it. Yeah. You know, so it, is, it sort of embodies many of those fast fashion, fast fashion principles, doesn't it's, it? It's, uh, yes, absolutely. And, and even, you know, the idea that colours, interior colours have uh, a particular lifespan and then, and then they're gone and there's a, there's a, a sort of a, a lost quality of um, long-term living, slow living that, that I think we really quickly need to get back and um, uh, and ultimately understand that that actually makes people happier. You know, it's actually better to have things than we, than we, um, 
you are engaged with, mm. that, that means something to you as well. Yeah. Oksana, um, obviously your world is probably less involved with the kind of fast fashion industry, the democratization of design, but you try to embody carbon, embrace this carbon consciousness in materials that quite often aren't seen, like insulation. Um, and in a way, there's a kind of uh, paradox, you know, because insulation is helping to cut carbon. Um, is there kind of, you know, almost carbon negative over its lifespan anyway? So, you know, um, what value does the, sort of, that this new approach of biomimetic thinking add to something like insulation? Yeah, that's a good point, Oliver. I mean, before I answer that, I wanted to agree with Seb, you know, in, in the fact that, you know, it's possibly a cultural problem more than anything else, the fact that we're in a situation where we are now, you know. It's it's a very fast-paced lifestyle where everything is a trend and, and there is a very lack of understanding who we are as consumers and then, and then that kind of is reflected in the industry because the industry is supplying the consumer and we are then lost as a, as a producer too and as a designer. So in terms of our product and our materials, um, it's often not just about ca capturing or locking the carbon in the material, but it's also having something to go with the product. And that is sorry, selling product as a service. So in terms of insulation, actually there is statistics, uh, Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, we build our buildings out of materials that are you know, they can last hundreds of years. Yeah, our buildings are not built to last hundreds of years anymore. And actually the statistics about 15 years of an average building lifespan or the building standing around. So why is our insulation then made out of materials that last for uh, you know, years? And hence why it's, maybe it's a question about um, design for disassembly or, or servicing. So insulation is meant to be because of the fire base can be looped back into manufacturing. If not, it's also okay. And I think this is maybe to us this is a huge environmental issue as well that if they do go into this they're completely safe. In fact they will enrich this economy and everything else. Hope I answered your question. I think I've kind of jumped <laughs> around a little bit. That's okay. Sorry. Come on. And Andrew there's obviously some conversation around fast fashion of the permanence or, or consumption of products and materials. Interestingly, I think when you get into the realm of architecture, there is an expectation that buildings, you know, when we build them, they're permanent, they're a fixed thing. Yeah. But it's rarely the case. Yeah. I mean, how can the use of timber sort of contribute to that thinking uh, in terms of us creating maybe more flexible buildings? Absolutely. I mean, adaptability of our buildings has to be integral to their design. You know, I, you know the idea that we kind of we build something and then we throw it away, you know, it is is waste culture on a massive scale, you know, and it, it can't happen, it can't happen. I mean, the problem that you have with concrete and steel buildings, with structures, is they're very difficult to adapt, you know, they're incredibly they're solid. All, they're, they're, all not, fixed together. they're all fixed together, yeah. all yeah. molded together, yeah. if you like. So it's like, so actually one of the beauties is tim with timber, we did it on a building the other day, we kind of, the building, uh, the use of that building changed, the client called us up, um, the team went in there, they cut a hole in the floor slab with a chainsaw, and then with the floor slab, they made the floor slab into a staircase. And hey presto, there you were, you know, no, suddenly you've got a stair where there was a floor. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, I think that- you Now know, that what, floor slab was made of concrete, timber? Timber, timber. sorry, yeah, everything's made of timber. Yeah, yeah it's one of my oh. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that, you know, the idea that actually, you know, two things just to kind of lead on from what you were just talking about, about, about the insulation and about the fact that over its lifetime, you know, it saves lots of energy is absolutely right. But the thing is that we're in a climate emergency right now, you know? And sure, you know, it might be that a certain material which expands loads of energy over a hundred years might pay that back, if you like, in carbon terms. But the thing is, that's based on the way that we produce energy now. We won't be producing energy in the few years as we produce it now. I mean, we know that already like this, you know, but it's like, but, um, so what we need to be doing is thinking about the carbon that we are emitting right now and the products and how those products, how producing those products is, is, is emitting carbon. And also, blah, 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 blah. and one more thing as well, is that actually just the amount, you know, it's so typically kind of Western 
kind of society that actually, if there's a problem, just pile more stuff on top of it. I think you were just saying that. And it's kind of like, you know, it's just endemic to the situation we're in. We're kind of like, we're in a hole, what do we do? We keep digging, you know? Well, it's actually less stuff, you know? Do less stuff, make less stuff, do it well, do it beautifully, do it adaptively, do it responsibly, you know, celebrate space, light, material, you know, enough of the kind of funny shapes, you know, and the wasteful kind of like, actually get excited about how good and how brilliant you are being to everybody else. <laughs> So quite enthusiastic about the subject. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah I, I am. am, I am. Okay, good. Um, I mean, there's a. Uh, I feel like sustainability has kind of run away with architects, and it's now become a bit of an engineering subject. And now I feel like there's a movement to come back and go. No, we've got to make architects part of the yeah, conversation. Yeah. You know, it became like, well, you know, any building could be a passive house if mm. we just engineer it right with the right kind of sealing it up and yeah. the right technology and. And now it feels like we're, we're looking at that. We've got to, we've got to make architects part of the conversation. I mean, yeah. Are you seeing some of those barriers come down? What were those barriers, and then what oh, way look, is that changing? It's everything's in shift at the moment. It's really exciting. You can see, like, there's a whole, whole profession, a whole art, which is really just reconsidering itself. You know, and in the process of a, of a paradigm shift, which is just, you know, it's just amazing and exciting to see. And I think that. You know, and I think that that, you know, for, for decades, that's been about more insulation and more triple glazing and more systems of management and all kind of like layering and layering. But actually now I think there's an understanding that, you know what, it's not really about applying more systems. It's about a fundamental change in the way in which we value architecture and the way in which we instigate design. So it has to be from the very outset, the carbon burden of that building needs to be part of the design philosophy of that building, not an application on top of it. And so I think that with engineers, you know, and others having designed lots of these systems, actually, you know, it needs the application of invention on top of that, of design invention on top of that. You know, you, we need to collaborate, you know, um, across the design spectrum. You know, the dynamism which Seb is able to kind of like immediately, oh, I'm sure it doesn't feel like that, you know, buildings take 10 years, <laughs> yeah. you know, so it's like the immediacy of being able actually to produce that furniture, for it to be in somebody's house, for somebody to be looking at that and considering it. So much of what we do is covered up, for me anyway, you know, it's kind of covered yeah, up, painted over. <laughs> so it's like actually, you know, being, you know, talking about it, expressing it is so incredibly important. And obviously we're talking very different scales here, from materials to furniture to buildings, and in a, a building, built environment, process you have a number of stakeholders that may be able to capture an understanding of the embodied carbon the life cycle analysis but Seb how has technology helped you to get a handle on the embodied carbon of a chair yeah so yeah um, well actually um, it's really easy which is the great news because I think anybody could do what we've done in our workshop um, Google is amazing uh, or, or any search engine is amazing for like finding out you know, uh, what, what is the current grid electricity emission in the UK? And um, it changes, but on average, it's kind of 0.454 kilograms of CO2 emitted for every kilowatt that you use. And once you know that, all you need to know is your electricity bill and you know your carbon footprint as a business. It's obviously going to use gas and things like that. So um, what we've been able to do is use kind of a spreadsheet. We take each of our machines, we understand what each of them uh, draws from the grid, and then we time it. And recently we've collaborated with a designer called Florian Dusport, who's a kind of genius uh, designer working in across all sorts of fields, but particularly tech. And um, we've come up with a system which automatically records the machinery that we're using. So you go up to the panel saw and you switch it on, you say I'm project five today, um, and it will allocate the energy use for that particular part of that particular project to a, to a spreadsheet. And then that publishes a report of the energy usage for that piece. And what's great about that is it allows us to be even more accurate because we can say, what if they were doing it at nine o'clock in the morning when the grid was running on nuclear, then there was no emissions for that particular process. So we can even fine tune when we make stuff, when we use heavy energy use. And um, as well as recording what we're emitting, we're also able to record um, what we're sequestering. So again, by research, there's a sort of growing body of kind of data around you know what different things actually store or emit um, and if you keep researching it it just keeps coming up and we, we're able to find out that you know the, the different hardwoods that we're using and what the probable 
um, carbon stored in a board or, or a pack of, or, you know, a bull, a tree trunk essentially. Um, and so it's it's basic tools. So it's not high advanced technology. It's it's, it's Excel spreadsheets and, and a bit of application of time and thought. Um, and what that's enabled us to do is to realize that actually as a business, everything that we do um, is carbon negative. So our, our activity, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're an economically profit, for-profit business that is sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere um, and having a, a net positive impact. Um, and, and we can then offer those products to our customers who can put that into their project and realize that that table emitted four kilos of CO2, but actually stored in that table uh, is eight kilos. And we say to the customer, as long as you don't burn it or chuck <laughs> it into the landfill, those are your eight kilos. You're responsible for them. Take care of them. Pass it onto your kids. And let's keep it locked up for as long as possible. So quality of construction is obviously fundamental. That is it sort of also influencing your your the way you, your choice of materials and the way that you design? Yes, I struggle to justify moving outside of working with wood. Um, so it very much influences the choice of materials. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it does uh, influence um, the way we design. I think um, you know. Uh, you think about the processes. I think naturally I was always sort of drawn to quite kind of, I think there's a sort of an instinctive sense of sort of a light, light footprint, light touch uh, in the way that I design. But certainly it makes you think about like leaving out the heavy energy intensive processes. Like for example, steam bending wood is kind of seen as a sort of beautifully simple thing, but actually it's pretty, pretty draining that because you've got to boil a boiler for three or four hours, which is considerably more than any kind of woodworking machine. Um, so yeah, it does influence what we do. Um, yeah. And, and you know, sort of moving on to that sort of idea of aesthetics. So outside, obviously, you know, we're talking about insulation. You mentioned that you know, your the, the the beauty and the the poetry of biomimicry is then sort of locked into a building wall under a floor, maybe mm. in, a, in a in a sort of ceiling recess space. Um, I mean, are you are you kind of expressing some of that poetry of the biomimetic approach in the polyester materials? You mentioned sort of starting to look at particular natural shapes. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, insulation is not the only thing we do with our materials. So our materials are very multifunctional. So mycelium is fantastic because it can grow in almost any shape and form. So, and actually, Biome is, is going to be launching um, a collection of customers hopefully at the end of this year. Um, so there are many ways that we can see to express to express the beauty and apply Biome to see them more international form and shape. Um, as well as with other material orb as well. Again, it's um, a direct replacement for MDF and plywood and any timber board. But also it's a compound which can be worn in any other shape. And I guess it's then working with it. I mean, biometrics can offer a lot of um, solutions to your structural you know, form of the object. So that's, that's another way to express working with the material and then things that put together in nature, you know, the, the angles, the, the shape and the form, you know, and even the way... Circulation routes from mitochondria are being mapped out. It's beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, um, again, it's... Um, You've got yeah. to geek out a little bit at some of those natural processes, <laughs> I think, but that's okay. Absolutely. I think we can all understand that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, a yeah. part of our studio, our studio consists of microscopes and 3D scanners, you know, so, but it's not directly mimicking that's not what biometrics is. It's it's taking the key parameters to design the perfect algorithm. So the essential, you know, solution function rather than just a replica of the form. Yeah. That's not kind of what we feel biometrics is at its best as. And Andrew, getting onto the subject of aesthetics, obviously, uh, you know, when we get into the, the realm of buildings, we have significantly different standards than the ones we do for the furniture or the materials. Mm -hmm. And over the last uh, sort of two, three years, there's obviously been a real change in the the approach, probably for the negative, in the use of timber, and certainly I think for the expression of timber. Um, it strikes me that this isn't replicated all over the world, and that in other countries there's a far greater ability to express the nature of timber buildings than there is in the UK. I mean, is that a frustration of yours? Hell yeah. <laughs> You're talking about fire, aren't you? I am. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know... <laughs> they must have hit you quite hard. Yeah, it did. It did. We lost a lot of projects. And, um, you know, for the record, 
I live in a CLT house. I live in a, in a building that I designed with some friends and I live on the seventh floor of a timber house clad in timber. Um, <clears throat> so I don't, I'm not talking of somebody who wouldn't, you know, doesn't do it themselves. I, the rest of the world are changing their building regulations and their planning laws to promote the use of timber buildings, to recognize embodied upfront carbon as part of kind of, as a, as a necessary kind of part of measuring the carbon of the building, an important part. <clears throat> In the UK, with residential buildings, we're going the other way, you know, and um, there is, I guess, after the awful tragedy at Grenfell, <clears throat> there is a, you know, there's a, there's a nervousness um, in the industry, in, in government primarily, about um, about timber buildings, and you know, <clears throat> which is which is very frustrating, you know. And the fire testing has been done. There is the, you know, there are the, you know, legitimate proofs that this is a kind of a safe means of construction, but yet, you know, it with an increasingly sort of isolated, kind of narrow-minded Britain. As well, you know, they're only good if they happen right. Those research points are only good if they happen right here, etc. So, that's the case with residential buildings. With office buildings, not at all. With office buildings, we're building loads of big timber office buildings. Why is that? What, what's the difference? The difference, um, well, the difference is in building regulations. The difference is also perhaps in the customers. We have a massive housing shortage, so people tend to buy housing uh, without the opportunity to ask the same kind of questions or interrogate their choice to the same degree. Um, whereas with office buildings, um, people are a little bit more, um, the purchaser perhaps, I want to come like hesitating here, it's like, but perhaps more discerning. You know, it's a more, it's generally a more kind of dynamic market, uh, more kind of like, um, they're more invested kind of uh, developer who, who builds office buildings. So, but they you know, have sort of corporate social responsibility. It yeah, has that. It's all about. I mean, this is it. I mean, the thing is, is that you know, I was thinking when you were talking just now, it's actually what's happened to architecture. It's not. It's the profession hasn't really changed. The profession hasn't very developed. You know, we're building buildings as we have done for a hundred years. The vast majority of buildings, but our clients have started to ask us. You know, have started to sort of. I think that there's a recognition that over the last ten years architecture has increasingly lost its social license you know people are not excited about architecture you know there is a kind of there is a feeling that architecture isn't really responding to the social requirements and social values that you know that should be expected of it and um, you know primarily at the moment i think that is around um that, that's around the burden on the planet and carbon and office development office builders seem to be far more aggressively uh excited and invested in making those changes. So we're not seeing those in the residential market, really, which is a shame. You know, the answer is always seems to be, you know, some sort of passive house, you know, put more stuff on it, clad it with more insulation, to give it bigger windows, do you know? And I, I just think that's the wrong thing to do, which is not a popular view. So we probably shouldn't go Good to be controversial. It. No, it's good. <laughs> Where else are we gonna bring this stuff up if it's not at a desired exhibition? <laughs> that's focused on the environment and sustainable yeah. design. So, yeah, yeah right ahead. So, it, it feels as if you know your approach is quite uh, labour intensive, and obviously you're taking a lot of care and attention. There can't be many designers that, that literally will uh, spend the time creating their own materials that they're going to build with. You know, I see all your kind of Instagram posts, sort of going through copse and woodlands and picking up bits of timber. Um, it must make it kind of expensive. So, I mean, how do you address the unlevel playing field with this more carbon conscious business approach? Yes. Um, yeah, is this all, I mean, or is question, this kind of a role yeah. for, for, for global standards? Yeah, so, um, well, there's, yes, I mean, there's a lot in the question there. I mean, um, I certainly think that we live in an age where stuff is too cheap, and it is quite easy to say that. Um, but there is a, there is an imbalance, which is that we generally exploit cheap labour in other parts of the world in order to feed our lifestyle, and um, and then you have the sort of additional element of this sort of short termism, where you actually buy things three or four times when you actually probably only need to buy it once. Yes, we are um, expensive when you compare us to some of the 
kind of massive retailers, largely because we don't reach economies of scale at our size, but but also because we won't compromise on the materials that we're using in the way that we um, produce things. And it is a great frustration to me, as it was a great frustration to William Morris and you know everyone else who's ever tried to uh, make genuinely democratic, positive change. Um, but I do think some levelling in the playing field uh, in terms of global standards, as you suggest, would be uh, would be good. I think David Attenborough's documentary Extinction, which was on on Sunday, which I think everyone should watch, uh, made a very good case for that in terms of saying, you know, particularly when we're talking about pollution, um, that uh, we can just export our pollution. We have very high standards here. Well, we don't, but we have some standards here. But we can just export our dyeing processes or whatever. And um, so it's sort of an exploitation of resources somewhere else. Somewhere else. To yeah. produce something really cheap. That's yeah. then competing with a better quality product here. from here. Mm. Yeah. So, so do you think there may be a, a sort of financial levy should be put on? You know, if you're going to be exporting yeah. these resources, I, I, I do. I mean, I, I'm not an economist, so I don't fully understand how tariffs, global tariffs, would work. But I do think there needs to be some kind of a leveling playing field. Um, it's a bit like uh, you know how we produce our food. Cheap food is not actually cheap. You know, you pay, you pay for it elsewhere. And um, we will pay for all of the cheap stuff that we're producing in other ways later. Or, you know, in, actually, as, as Andrew said, we're in a crisis right now. So we are um, paying for it with our with our climate. So it's who pays and when. And but we're um, shifting that that payment onto future generations. We're kicking it down the road. Exactly. So it's, that's it's not our problem. We'll no, be, exactly. We'll exactly. Probably we can be, carry on as we are because someone we'll else probably will probably be unlocking our own carbon by that stage yeah. in the ground. We'll be fossils. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I, I think there is a you know it's kind of macroeconomic uh, question to be answered about that. Um, it's a lot to take on for a furniture designer yeah. <laughs> designing beautiful things. But yeah. I mean, our role is obviously expanded. We can't just be a designer of pretty things. Uh, if you are engaged in consuming or making anything today, you are engaged in a political act. Knowing what we know about the damage that we do from our consumption, if you do anything, you're engaged in politics. And so we have to take that responsibility seriously that applies to consumers as much as it does designers architects factories whatever um, and uh, and I do take it very seriously and you know it's the great thing about what we can do is that we can kind of wrap up this quite important message in, in a product which looks lovely and that's that's a kind of a blessing uh, for the business that I've ended up having um, and I think that that's where design has this lovely soft element to it which sits between science and other sort of harder uh, subjects is that we can get into people's homes and hearts and we can really we can make people think about things whilst also making their lives more beautiful and functional. Mm. And, and Oksana, sort of talking about the kind of the different things that design can deliver, obviously you know, a lot of your work is focused on the creation of, of materials, um, having sort of you know, body, low body carbon, or zero body carbon, but what about the sort of the other issue that's happening at the moment is, you know, clearly there's a, a massive drive for carbon consciousness, but also health and well-being are built one. What is the nexus between these ideas, and how do we design for both carbon conscious, consciousness and to the creation of healthy building for things that we might not even see, um, and to create products that are, are valuable for our future and also our well-being? Yeah, I mean, to us, a biome, it's um, they don't they're not separate things; they're the same thing, and one goes with another you know so being con conscious about the waste you produce and the carbon you produce and keeping that off to the next generation plus the well-being and the health of the occupants of our buildings now um to us as a company it's the same thing i think with our materials that's exactly what we're tackling because um so much of our work is around waste streams we are conducting extensive researches into all sorts of waste streams um, putting that you know to the next level of science pushing the science to, to to make it functional that way to turn it into beautiful materials um we would never touch synthetic so it's all organic and bio-based and for the reason that's for the reason of well-being and health because the insulation is going into the buildings if it's not breathable um we talked about it just before the event but you know the house needs to breathe and so it can't lock in moisture because that's, that's very dangerous and actually we I think have six litres of water in, in, in every room or something like that this crazy amount of moisture locked um, so yeah I think it's again it's, it's 
sorry if we keep going on about biomimetics, but it's literally learning that. So uh, using chemicals and materials that are safe for living, for living creatures and, you know, producing in such a way that is very minimal, almost an ambient, ambient temperature, just the way nature does it, you know, without heat, heat and treat the type of attitude, as well as circulating and recycling everything. So having those cycles going with everything we do, you know, and I guess all of that, it's a systemic approach, isn't it? So it's not just one thing or the other. It's, it's the systemic thinking when we design, create, tackle our problems, you know, I think. So, so yeah, for us, it, it's all intertwined. I think once you think that way, when it's everybody's involved, or stakeholders, waste, health, and everything else, that's, I guess, the way to approach these things and, and succeed, hopefully, one day as a society. <laughs> and Andrew, you're obviously very passionate about the subject of, of timber buildings and sustainability um, and your uh, your role with the architects of the Clare. What are you hoping to achieve with that? With the movement, with yeah. Architects of Clare. So, um, you know, Architects of Clare, we're 18 months old now and we asked our profession to sign up to uh, 11 points of declaration to uh, basically to help improve not only to, to stop you know to, 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 to stop the problem but also to try and improve the situation um, and we are really all about just spreading that word so we're now nearly a thousand practices in the UK uh, nearly 5,000 practices globally in 23 different countries and it really you know it's centered around changing the conversation it's not about naming or shaming or kicking people out or whatever it's about changing the conversation about changing the value of design, changing the value of how we think about uh, our profession, our industry. Um, and, you know, it's about getting to that tipping point where it's, where it's kind of okay to talk loudly and passionately about these issues and not be bizarre. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Not be like the weirdo in the corner, you know, he doesn't get invited out anymore. He's talking about timber, whoever. You know, it's kind of like, it's actually about, you know, really kind of forcing that tipping point so that this becomes the kind of major currency of our conversation. And is there a sort of mirroring of Extinction Rebellion, you know, as being a kind of more anarchic group and the Architects of Clare being kind of relatively, you know, uh, as a sort of regulated profession, it's, you know, it's okay I mean, I wouldn't to call, step up. And... I wouldn't call Extinction Rebellion anarchic, actually, at all. I, think I mean, I they... think it's sort of a... No, no, I know, but I, do, I think these press, are... In the popular press, it's sort of, you know, they're anarchic, they're out of control. Yeah. Know. But that's are we talking perceived. in terms of popular press now? Or not? We are, very much so, but you know, that's that's what's going out to millions. And yeah. you know, I think the role, it, it's time for architects to step up, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And I kind of, you know, and if we can step up to the degree that Extinction Rebellion have shown leadership, that Greta Thunberg, David Attenborough, all these have shown this incredible leadership, you know, then I think that that would be a very, you know, very proud moment. I'd be very proud to be part of that. Yeah. Um, I think that Extinction Rebellion have brought our attention to issues, to things, you know, just specifically around kind of like the way we talk about climate change in our press, in, you know, whether it's the sun or whether it's the BBC, it's not enough, it's not good enough, you know, and it's got a so-called climate change now they're saying in the BBC, this is crazy, this is crazy, mm. you know, it's just like, these are established planetary facts that we need to act on, you know, so I'm, I'm completely behind Extinction Rebellion, I think they're fantastic, absolute admiration. Right, so you sort of answered my next question, oh, yes. which I'm going to pose the others. That's okay. Uh, a little bit of the spread of uh, that's okay. Um, so, what gives you hope, Oksana, for the future of carbon consciousness in design? Well, I, I personally am a big fan of human beings. I think we're wonderful. We are inquisitive. We are creative. You know, unfortunately, we've we've maybe steered away from the you know being a part of this wonderful world playing our part. We've sort of being separated balance. ourselves from nature. We've seen we ourselves have. at the top of a pyramid as opposed yeah. to part itself. Yeah, I think yeah. we got a bit confused, you know, and, and then the whole thing happened and then all of a sudden, you know, we're kind of realising that it's killing us and, and, and everything else. So, But what did you hope? That's a, us, on a us, positive I, message, I, I, I yeah, think, we have the ability. To I think we, we, because we are part of it, surely it might be confusing and we might not see it, what we're supposed to do right now as architects, designers, material developers, but I think we can. So I think it's just 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 being honest and listening and, 
and observing and maybe being brave enough to drop everything we know mm -hmm. about how things are made, how buildings are built, how, you know, everything and, and go back into the forest and, and relearn, you know, and, and, and that's why we again. can learn so much from nature. Biomimetics. Yes, biomimetics. Yes, yeah. so, so that's what gives yeah. me hope. But I, mean, I think that, it's us. Phrase, it's within us. You know, we've always done it like this. We have. Yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah, I think the secret is within us. So we don't really. Yeah, so humans give me hope. Great. And Seb, what gives yeah, you hope? I will, very much leading on from what Sana said, I think the thing that gives me hope is that we, we have the answers. Mm. You know, that actually we, we know that we know the way out of this. Yeah, it's I within our grasp. It yeah. is, and I yeah. think maybe 15, 20 years ago, maybe it was ambiguous, maybe the conversation, the debate still needed to be had, mm. and the solutions weren't clear, but we're now just in the nick of time, uh, hopefully, uh, have the answers. And as that progresses, you know, we're still learning. Like, I'm, I'm so animated at the moment by uh, rewilding. You know, I know that we're talking about carbon here, but there are elements of carbon sequestration that's essential in letting nature manage land. and um, But in terms of the way that we're learning that you can turn a biodiversity decline on a sixpence by just you know, letting that land go, putting in the right animals and, and, and allowing it to become a living landscape. You've written a lot about net farm, don't you? Yeah, you? exactly. I'm, I'm a massive fan of net, but also you know, even now the wildlife trusts um, are releasing bison in Kent and there's beavers coming back to the UK. There's like huge, huge, huge changes that are happening. Again, you know, Britain being 15 years behind the Netherlands and all these other you know, countries. Um, we're, we're sort of like realizing that big changes can happen with small actions, changes in legislation, small legal changes. And, and so it all feels within reach. And um, I think that you know, there is a shift in consumer um, uh, views and emotions. And I think that's beginning to reflect in the political sphere. And yeah. I, I think we're gonna get there. I think, I think certainly uh, you know, current pandemic and the sort of lockdown has forced us to change yeah. our approach to consumerism yep. and the need to just constantly buy stuff I think more it's also, and then going back to something better. And it's also allowed us to, to realise that we can make fundamental changes. We can stop doing things and do them in a different way. Mm. You know, just like the whole world is stopped and now it's doing, it's just like, you know, this is, surely must give us a great, you know, great sense of optimism, mm. you know, as to how we can really grasp this and become part of the solution. Yeah. Okay, so we're kind of just wrapping it up now. We've got like a minute each. I'd like to hear your call to action. To the viewers out there, going to be architects, designers, they're going to be building stakeholders. You know, what do you want to say to them? You know, if you're going to come away with one thing that you can do to become carbon conscious in the designs that you're creating, that you're buying, what is that? So, Measure it. Just measure it. Um, you know, it's so easy now. There are apps for it, um, for your personal consumption. Um, it's very easy to measure your electricity bill. Ask questions about what your impact is and take some responsibility. You know, it's no, it's no good thinking that David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg are going to get us out of this from Extinction Rebellion. You know, it takes personal action. Um, so measure it, be curious, take action, and. Um, when getting back on an aeroplane is normal again, maybe think twice about it. Seb, you stole my answer. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, <laughs> A consensus is okay. Yeah, I guess similar things. I mean, uh, personally, the reason why I have become carbon conscious and dedicated my life and career to this is because I've been on a personal journey, you know? So potentially, I'd like to urge people to if you haven't done that already, been that on, on that journey where it, where it pains you, you can't be a part of this vicious, you know, um, generation of carbon, just the negative impact on the world. Um, try and induce that, perhaps, you know, relearn, re to appreciate, you know, um, the natural way of being, the less fast paced, more harmonic and balanced, and, go on that journey and I think hopefully that will then tell you all the answers on how to capture the carbon and be more carbon cautious. Andrew? I think that um, I think that these problems that we that we see I think if you take them as an individual can feel very big quite oppressive 
And I think that, you know, we might have all given up plastic straws. Plenty of us, you know, in architecture, certainly plenty of us will specify tons of single use plastic. You know, I think this is about our place in the community rather than taking this on the So I think this is about making fundamental changes in the place where you work. You know, just a few companies are responsible for the vast majority of the planet's carbon. So don't feel oppressed by this as an individual. Feel excited about this as an opportunity in society. So really embrace it. Embrace Measure it. Measure it. Absolutely. Make it your you friend. know, we can be the most important humans that have ever lived right now. What a lovely idea. Oh, wow. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> well, I don't think we're going to get to a bigger statement than that at the end of this. So at that point, unless anyone's got anything to talk about, <laughs> I'm going to draw this to a close. So that just leaves me to thank our partners, Biotecture for the beautiful green wall, Vestra for the furniture, Equinox Kombucha that we've been drinking, Bramley Hand Sanitizer, Angle Poise Lights, Stormboard for our beautiful upcycle plastic sign, and of course our guests, Andrew, Oksana and Seb, thank you so much for your thoughts, your time, your passion on the subject of carbon consciousness in design, uh, which is the second of three of our planted uh, on a series. Next up, we've got blooming buildings. How can we harness the power of nature to build environments that are happier, healthier places to live and work? My name's Oliver Heath, and this has been Planted on Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>